Hello everyone, this is Luxon. If you're one of the new subscribers coming here from the Motu Patlu video, I'd just like to remind you one more time that that's not my usual style of content. I more often make these Splatoon 2 guides and Let's Plays, so I won't be offended if you unsubscribe now because, in all honesty, you're probably not going to be seeing many videos like the Motu Patlu one in the near future. you here for the Splatoon though! Welcome to another Splatoon 2 guide. I haven't uploaded for the past two weeks because I was actually going to a Splatoon 2 LAN, Squidstorm 2017, in Boston. So, two weeks ago I was preparing for that, and last week was the week I was actually there, so I obviously couldn't make a video. But, today we're here to talk about weapons that have special attributes that other weapons in their class don't have. This is a very broad description and can encompass a lot of things, so without further ado, let's get started with the first weapon class you're ever introduced to, the Shooter. Most shooters behave the exact same way, just with different stats, but the two nozzle noses, L3 and H3, are different. Every other shooter class weapon in the game is fully automatic, meaning that as long as you have the right trigger pressed down and you have ink left, you'll continue shooting. But the nozzle noses are semi-auto. That means that every trigger press will only release three bullets of ink, and you'll have to release and press again if you want to shoot more. This has both advantages and drawbacks. The advantage is that when you don't have the trigger pressed down, or even after the shots end when you still have it pressed, you won't be moving as if you're shooting, you'll just be moving as if you're running and not shooting, which has a huge movement advantage and lets you strafe around a lot better and beat out other similarly ranged shooters in firefights pretty easily. The disadvantage, though, is that your aim needs to be a lot better and you have to be a lot better at leading your shots in order to hit someone who's moving, otherwise you'll completely miss and they can just straight up escape in the lull between your shots. For the purpose of this video, I will only be going over weapons that are out as of the weekend this is going up. So, as of now, there's only one version each of L3 and H3 in the game. While the H3's kit isn't as bad as it was in the first game, the L3 is still by far the better weapon due to its faster fire rate, ability to be more nimble and take advantage of the strafing better, and the fact that it's a better turfing weapon than the H3. Possibly future kits will turn that around, Cherry H3 was a good weapon at the end of the first game, but that's not for this video to decide. Blasters were originally a subclass of shooters that were expanded into their own class in the second game. As such, the way they function is pretty much the same as a shooter, just with an additional area of effect at the end of their shots, and in general a much slower fire rate. As such, even the Clash Blaster functions directly under any archetypes you put blasters under, so there aren't really any unique blasters under the umbrella I'm using for this video. The same could be said for rollers. Even the Flings' enhanced vertical flick distance still falls under the way rollers work. However, their subclass that was expanded to a different class, the Brushes, actually do have a difference now that the Vertical Flick's been added into the game. All Rollers have a Vertical Flick, and all Brushes, despite just playing as a modified version of the Roller, don't have one, so now, both the Ink Brush and the Octo Brush are actually uniquely behaving weapons. As with the first game, in general, the Octo Brush is better, even though the Ink Brush Nouveau was just released, so, if you're going to be using a brush, you're probably going to want to use Octo. Out of the three OG weapon classes, Charger is actually the most interesting one in this regard, because it has not just one, but two unique weapons. Starting off with the one that was in the first game, the Bamboozler has a unique attribute where any of its uncharged shots will go the same distance as a fully charged one, where every other charger, the distance your shot will go, will increase as you charge up, and it'll only go the maximum distance if you're fully charged. This helps the Bambi out in two ways. First off, it makes it a bit better at painting turf than it would have if it followed regular charger distance rules, so that's always a good thing. But better painting in a Splatoon game is kinda, kinda a good thing to have. And second off, since it's the only charger that can't kill with a fully charged shot, this helps you shoot someone with a fully charged shot and then immediately tap shot them afterwards to finish them off, and you'll still be able to get the kill as long as the person's still within range of that fully charged shot. The second of these unique chargers is probably the easiest one to guess here. It is the legend itself introduced in Splatoon 2, the GooTuber. This one's special attribute is one that was pretty much your only selling point if you actually want to play this thing, which is the fact that it can store charge a lot longer than any other charger can, and in fact the Bamboozler can't store charge at all. This was later changed to encompass the fact that you can store a charge of any capacity, not just a fully charged shot. Although this is kind of more of a nerf than a buff now, because 
there's not really much use for storing a partially charged shot, and that now gives you a little glowing circle over where you are anytime you try to swim into ink with even a partial charge stored up, so... They almost made the goo tuber even worse than it was, despite buffing it at the same time. Yay game! Even though there are only three sloshers, there is in fact one that does play differently than the rest. That one being, of course, the sloshing machine. While blasters now are their own separate class, so they're not all technically unique shooters, there is only one slosher class, which means that the sloshing machine's ability to do AoE damage and get direct hits for extra damage is in fact something unique to it that no other slosher can do. As of the day I'm recording this, unfortunately, Splatlings haven't really been getting much love from the devs lately, since there are only three of them out right now and one of them is an alternate kit. But, even if you were to include the Hydra Splatling in there, there really aren't any Splatlings that stand out specifically in terms of their mechanics. Moving on to Dooleys, the unique weapon in this class is one that's kind of a new one and old one at the same time, that being the Dooley Squelchers. This one's unique because it's a unique attribute that was only granted to the weapon as a result of a patch change, in this case being 1.4.0. The official patch notes for this change read that the player can now move after performing a dodge roll, but before they can perform their next action. In practice, this means that you can sort of cancel the ending lag of your dodge roll into walking around a bit before you're able to start shooting again. This can be very helpful, it lets you sort of skate around the enemy in places, and kind of move your dodge rolls a little bit further than you could, while sacrificing a little bit of invulnerability and increased aim at the end. Even though there are only two Brellas out right now, and this technically isn't a unique attribute, just something that happened to arise of the way the Tentabrella was changed in the 1.4.0 update, I'm still going to count it as a unique weapon. The way it was buffed in 1.4, or one of the things that was buffed, is the amount of time before you can start walking again after shooting. This was changed by an entire 10 frames shorter, or a sixth of a second, which in a fast-paced game like Splatoon, can mean pretty much everything. This ended up creating an effect sort of like the Dually Squelcher's dodge roll buff, where it looks like you can skate around a bit while shooting, and if you wear a bunch of run speed up, this is accentuated even more to where it sort of looks like you're sliding around everywhere. Now, I don't think this was an intentional thing, and it's more of a visual thing than anything, but I am going to count this as something making the Tentabrella unique, even though it doesn't really help it be any less of a horrible weapon. Maybe there are going to be other Brellas in the future that do the same thing and cause me to remove considering it unique, but that's not for this video to decide. As always, thank you for watching if you made it this far. If you like the video and want to see more Splatoon 2 guides and general competitive play and stuff, you can subscribe, I got a Twitter and Twitch in the description that you can follow me on too. And until next time, this is Luxon, signing off.